Well, I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar and followership with Barbara Kellerman. This is the first of the series of the International Leadership Association webinars for 2008. My name is Ira Chaliff, and I am an ILA member and this webinar's moderator. Before Barbara starts her talk, let me give you some brief information on ILA webinars. ILA will present one webinar each month this year. Every webinar is for members of the association. Now, this is just one of several good reasons to join ILA. The next webinar will be conducted on March 27th by Steve Denning. Steve is an expert on storytelling and leadership. His talk will be on the secret language of leadership, how leaders inspire action through narrative. April's webina webinar will feature Noel Tishy from the University of Michigan. Noel will speak on the importance of judgment in leadership, based on his new book on this topic, written with Warren Bennis. You can learn more about these and other upcoming webinars, as well as about other ILA membership benefits, at www.ila-net.org, ila-net.org. Our speaker today is Barbara Kellerman. She is the James McGregor Burns Lecturer in Public Leadership at Harvard University's JFK School of Government. Barbara received her doctorate in political science from Yale. She is a co-founder of the International Leadership Association and the author and editor of many books, including her most recent, which you see up on your screen, Followership, How Leaders Are Creating Change and Changing Leaders, hot off the press this month. Barbara has been teaching the first course on followership at the JFK School of Government. This past December, the Harvard Business Review published her article, What Every Leader Needs to Know About Followers. Barbara's focus on the follower component of the leader-follower relationship is sure to bring new attention to this historically understudied field. After Barbara finishes her talk, we'll have a Q&A session. You can send questions through the question and answer feature of your control panel. And you can send them at any time and they'll go into the question queue. Lastly, let me say that the magazine Leadership Excellence ranked Barbara sixth on the list of the 100 best minds on leadership last year. As I am only ranked 77th on that list, at this point, it is appropriate that I turn the mic over to Barbara. Well, thank you very much, Ira. I hope you and everyone else can hear me. And I welcome my fellow ILA members. And Ira, I do want to say what a particular pleasure it is to be working with you for this hour. Uh, you have been a pioneer in the area of followership, and I'm very glad we're able to share this occasion. Thank you. So I will now proceed to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the book. I think the format that we've agreed at on is that I will talk for about 25 minutes or so. And then we're going to go to some Q&A. I look forward to that and possibly also engaging in a bit of an exchange on some of this with Ira. And we will end this webinar at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, uh, as all of you, since you're all dedicated to the general subject of leadership, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my own personal and professional trajectory in this general regard. The last book I wrote before this one, I, I did another one on women in leadership, but the one that I fully authored was called Bad Leadership. I had written by then many articles and books on leadership, but in the Bad Leadership book, for the first time, I myself did more than pay lip service, which is what most of us do most of the time, to the leader-follower relationship. And in fact, the more I uh, studied the nature of bad leadership, the more I realized it was impossible to think about bad leadership without thinking absolutely simultaneously about bad followership. So if you look at the slide in front of you called Key Points, you will see that bullet point number one is the web. The web that I talked about in bad leadership was three strands, consisted of three strands. The first one is the leader, or it can also be the third one, but it was the three strands were are the leader, the context in which the leader is embedded, and
and the third inevitable strand are the followers. And as I said, in writing that book, it dawned on me how curious it was that our field has been so dreadfully negligent of the follower. Ira, as you know, some of you at least, has written a very good book on the subject called The Courageous Follower. But by and large, that's it, with maybe one or two or three other exceptions. So you have this ridiculous contrast of a billion books, I like to say, on leadership and virtually nothing on followership. So I resolved, as I was writing Bad Leadership, to dedicate my next book to the general subject. As bullet point number two suggests, and as I've already indicated in my remarks, the uh, field has grown obsessively, ridiculously, in my view, leader-centric. I think we're particularly focused on developing good leaders without a whole lot of evidence that what we do actually works. And in this zeal to develop good leaders, we have really neglected this other side of the coin, so to speak. So part of my mission in writing the book was to not do away with the leader. Of course not. That's not the point but it is simply to broaden our conception of what, in fact, we're doing. And the third bullet point is the importance of being a follower. Uh, as you all know, one of the reasons followers are given such short shrift is because they're considered trivial. They're considered of negligible importance, at least in comparison with the leader. And as I have done my work and I have come to understand this a little better, I realize, number one, that followers have always been far more important than we leadership experts generally give them credit for, and I'll say perhaps a little bit more about that later. But that uh, there's a second part of this, which is that in the 21st century, as I argue in the book, they are becoming already and will become even more important than they ever have been before. We're up to the next slide, and as you can all see, it is about definitions. I think one of the problems with much of the leadership literature is this constant struggle about definitions. We never quite know how even to define the word leadership, and God knows we don't even concur on that, nor certainly do we concur in our conception of followers. Uh, I, of course, don't think of them particularly as sheep, but I did feel a need to uh, begin this book, and I think I do this really in the introductory chapter, uh, to come up with a definition that would be economical, that would make sense to people. It's not meant to be engraved in stone. Different people might have different views, but this is the definition that I am using in this book. And as you will, <coughs> excuse me, as you will see, it says followers are subordinates who have less power, authority, and influence than do their superiors and who therefore usually, and please note the parenthetical remark, but not invariably fall into line. A second definition, followership, like leadership, the other side. What does it imply? It implies a relationship, in this case rank, between superiors and subordinates and a response behavior of the former to the latter. In other words, I am presuming right at the start, and I presume throughout the book, that rank does not necessarily determine behavior. It usually does, but it does not always. As with bad leadership, where I wanted to look at the universe of bad leaders, and for that I came up with seven different types of bad leadership, in this book, I wanted to look at the universe of followers. We make the mistake generally because we pay followers so little mind of sort of lumping them together and not dividing them in any way that makes sense, either for followers themselves or indeed for leaders and managers. I wanted to come up with an extremely simple way of dividing them one from another, and my measure was simply level of engagement. So the five different types of followers are isolates, bystanders, participants, activists, and diehards. I begin the book by talking about fictions, and I uh, fell upon this, by the way, there's a FedEx ad now running on television, which has a similar theme, and it's the theme that uh, those of us in the leadership 
Chinese are very familiar with, which is never follow. This never follow slogan was for, I think it was seven years, the slogan of Audi of America. And the FedEx commercial that is now running has a bunch of uh, would-be students of leadership in the end acting like lemmings. So heaven forfend the message is heaven forfend that we ever, ever follow. And with that is an entire mythology that suggests to follow is bad and weak and timid and to lead is good and strong and brave. And it's exactly that kind of thinking that I want us to leave behind once and for all. Now, I suggested earlier that followers have always been important and that, indeed, they're more important now than ever before. And I just thought it might be interesting for you, for me to put up three historical markers, uh, roughly moments in time at which followers began to seize in a much more aggressive way than they ever had before power and authority and influence from those who were ostensibly their superiors. The first year is 1789, roughly the year, of course, um, that covers the French and American revolutions and what is a revolution about if not taking power away from those who have it. The year 1848, which I, if we were in a room together, I would have you guess why I choose that year. But it is the year in which we had the publication both of the Communist Manifesto, and again, I, I need hardly tell most of you the theme, workers of the world unite, and that could as well be followers of the world unite. And it was also the year that um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton published uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Women in the United States. 1848. So you had this wonderful confluence event of events in which uh, manifestos, as it were, were produced, which talked about grabbing power from those who have. 1963, certainly in the United States, uh, uh, but again, this was a movement that was uh, to a considerable extent worldwide. In this country, it was the year uh, Martin Luther. King published his letters from a Birmingham jail. The same year, Betty Friedan came out with her book, The Feminine Mystique. And again, you had the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, which uh, whose legacies uh, really do linger. Uh, we're living now in a culture which the 1960s made, which is far less inclined than we were before, than it was before, to uh, respect figures of authority. This is simply a visual symbol of what I call and what others have called the world the 60s made, which is the world in which we all now live. The second major change, which is even more recent because it's been ubiquitous only in the last 10 years or so, and I think we're only beginning to understand it, is the information revolution. I think we don't yet know how the internet, uh, cell phones, email, impact on relations between leaders and led. But we do know that, in, that information is vastly more distributed, more available now than it was before. And since information is power, all of us who have access to any technology at all have a kind of power uh, that we did not have in the past. So I. I think as we dissect this phenomenon more in the coming years, that is the growing importance of followers, I think the role of technology will become apparent and our understanding of it uh, much, uh, much broader and deeper. The next several slides uh, simply exemplify with a picture, uh, I call them leaders living dangerously. I think leaders do live dangerously now much more dangerously than they did even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, a fellow who works at the Wall Street Journal named Alan Murray wrote a book, a book called Revolt in the Boardroom. And he talks about how CEOs, and I talk a good deal about this in my book as well, are so much more easily toppled now than they were in the past. This is, of course, applies to the private sector. Paul Wolfowitz, as many of you will know, who was the former president of the World Bank, um, was toppled also remarkably easily when it became known that there had been uh, perhaps uh, 
some slight wrongdoing with regard to a woman who he per with whom he was personally involved. But within the real point I would make on this is that within one day of this becoming public news, uh, the Staff Association of the World Bank issued a statement to the public that said he should leave, that Wolfowitz should leave. He, of course, hung in for several weeks and months, but was obliged ultimately to resign. These two women, uh, both uh, formerly of Hewlett Packard, are simply exemplars of many CEOs who are the victims of stakeholders, followers, shareholder activists, boards, etc., the media, a lot of other players that are simply watching them and monitoring them as they have never been monitored or watched before. And finally, the final picture in this particular series is, of course, of my own uh, former president. By that I mean, uh, since I'm at Harvard, uh, Lawrence Summers, of course, was for several years the president of Harvard University. And again, as many of you will know, he was upended by Harvard's faculty for the first time ever. Uh, once he made uh, yet another misstatement, uh, he said it was a misstatement. He only suggested that women might be less uh, adroit at science and engineering. He didn't say they were. But he was immediately, literally immediately caught in a maelstrom. And this was an email. This was a story about emails. Within day, hours and days, faculty had emailed each other, and uh, many, rather large proportion of them were up in arms. And again, although he apologized profusely over and over, it was um, it was not adequate, and uh, the family, uh, the faculty, uh, issued one vote of no confidence, which was the first time ever that Harvard's faculty had issued a vote of no confidence. And then later on, a couple of months later, when a second one was threatened, a second vote of no confidence, he decided he had no choice but to resign. So another point of followership is that, and it is really one of the key points, is that leaders have less power and influence now than they did in the past, and followers are getting more power and influence than they did in the past. Let me go again quite briskly through the five different types. Uh, type one as I said earlier, is the isolate, and here is the definition. Isolates are completely detached. They do not care about their leaders or know anything about them or respond to them in any way. Their alienation is nevertheless of consequence. By default, by knowing nothing and doing nothing, isolates strengthen still further leaders who already have the upper hand. Let me just point you, uh, point you to the very last line because it, it, it makes for me one of the points that I'll elaborate on just a bit, which is that we assume that people who do nothing uh, are unimportant altogether, but that's wholly incorrect. If you do nothing, if you know nothing, you are by default supporting the status quo. Here is an isolate in the commons, and these are direct quotes from various books. Uh, we have that, of course, much less this time around. This campaign has engaged, this presidential <coughs> campaign has engaged people uh, in a way they've not been engaged for many years, but nevertheless, it's still a common syndrome. I'm not interested in politics. I dislike politics. My vote wouldn't make any difference anyway. Voting is too much trouble. John Doe in the Commons, Jane Doe in the workplace. These isolates are workers, people in the workplace who will say and think things such as, I don't care about my work. I have no interest in my leaders and managers. I have no interest in my fellow followers. My only interest is in my paycheck. In other words, isolates in the workplace show up but do and do their jobs minimally but no more. Type two follower, bystanders. Bystanders observe, but they do not participate. They make a deliberate decision to stand aside, to disengage from their leaders and from whatever is the group dynamic. This will withdrawal is in effect a declaration of neutrality that amounts to tacit support, again, this tacit support for whoever and whatever constitutes the status quo. 
those of you who are viewing this will know immediately the case that I analyze in some depth in the book. Uh, this, of course, is the leader. And here are the bystanders. I do have in my chapter on bystanders a rather close analysis of the role of the bystander, that is, Germans who may not have sympathized with Hitler, may not have supported the genocide, but whose unwillingness in any way to intervene contributed significantly to what happened. Type 3, participants. Participants are in some way engaged. They clearly favor their leaders and the groups and organizations of which they are members, or they are clearly opposed. In either case, they care enough to put their money where their mouths are, that is, to invest some of what they have, time, for example, to try to have an impact. So the case. The case I used was the fascinating case of Merck and Vioxx. I'm sure many of you know the Vioxx fiasco, which turns out to have been driven not by the CEO, not by the man you are now looking at, Raymond Gilmartin, who during this entire period was the chief executive officer of Merck. Rather, it was driven by people like Edward Skolnick. Skolnick had been a research scientist for some years with Merck. He and his fellow researchers developed Vioxx, they pushed Vioxx, they kept pushing Vioxx even after warning signals. So this is a case where you, in order to understand how what happened, uh, in order to understand what happened, you cannot simply look to the leader. The leader will tell you n not, I shouldn't say nothing about how Vioxx ensued, but very little. The place to look is in the middle of the organization. In this case, a range of participants who played uh, key roles in developing this particular drug, and Gil Martin left them alone, by and large, because among other things, they were scientists and doctors and researchers, and he had, unlike his predecessor, by the way, Roy Vagelos, he had no such credentials. So the Vioxx story, very simply, is that of a drug that ended up being a blockbuster. It was a huge, huge seller, so you can imagine it was a painkiller, and you can imagine how uh, reluctant Merck was to do anything, even though there were early and continuing warning signs. The participants, that is men like Skolnick, refused to agree to have a warning label put on the Vioxx package. And so uh, the reports kept on coming in of patients who, when prescribed Vioxx, got either heart attacks or strokes or whatever. Finally, the company was forced to pull Vioxx from the market in 2004. The net result of the fiasco is over 25,000 product liability lawsuits, and only very recently, in the last several months, has the case sort of been settled, however, to the tune of approximately $5 billion and uh, enormous public humiliation for Merck itself. Type 4, activists. Activists feel strongly about their leaders, and they act accordingly. They are eager, energetic, and engaged. Because they are heavily invested in people and process, they work hard, either on behalf of their leaders or to undermine and even unseat them. Activists play a large role in what happens. Is, uh, they are the perfect kind of follower that if we ignore them and try to understand human history, we ignore them at our peril. The case I look at, the story I tell in some detail, is the story of what happened to Cardinal Bernard Francis Law, who was the Archbishop of Boston for several years. What happened to this man when it became known that he had tolerated and hushed priestly abuse? Uh, the scandals that ensued, many of which were first uh, revealed by the Boston Globe, led to a, a revolt, as it were, among the Catholic laity. They formed a group particularly called Voice of the Faithful, 
These were people who considered themselves devout and good Catholics, but who were no longer willing to tolerate their own cardinal and who felt he had to be pushed out for uh, tolerating what, as I said, was priestly abuse, and this was not just one case, but several fairly egregious cases. The Voice of the Faithful, these activists, marshaled, they organized, they, they protested in the streets, they got enormous public support, and in the end, as this picketer would suggest, because they were relentless in their pursuit of their quarry, uh, in the end they got the Pope, who was not uh, anxious to pull Cardinal Law from his Boston Post, the Pope finally agreed, and the Cardinal finally agreed that he had to go. He was driven out by faithful, by voice of the faithful, who were activists and who testify again to the power of the follower. Finally, there is the fifth type, diehards. Diehards are, as their name implies, prepared to die if necessary for their cause, whether an individual, an idea, or both. Diehards are deeply devoted to their leaders, or in contrast, they are ready to remove them from positions of power, authority, and influence by any means necessary. Diehards are defined by their dedication, including their willingness to risk life and limb. Being a diehard is all-consuming. It is who you are, and it determines what you do. The story I tell for this chapter on diehards is about Operation Anaconda, an, an American-led multinational military mission launched in Afghanistan hard on the heels of 9-11 when Afghan fighters joined U.S. troops and allied warplanes to attack hundreds of suspected Al-Qaeda and Taliban holdouts in eastern Afghanistan. Uh, this is just a picture. This was, uh, this was real. Uh, lives were lost. It was, uh, by most accounts, a rather botched operation. But I, of course, was interested in looking at diehard military men, uh, followers, as it were, willing to die for their cause. These were arguably the two most prominent leaders. I don't need to identify them. Uh, their pictures and titles speak for themselves. And I talk about four followers in particular. Well, two, I guess, two U.S. officer followers, and their names are here. I really don't have time to go into more detail now. And then actually four non-commissioned officers. Uh, several of them are depicted here. They're all talked about in the book. And again, their willingness to risk life and limb, which leads me to one point that I want to make, and I may as well make it at this point. One of the things that I discovered in writing this book is that the leader-follower tie is weaker, I repeat, weaker than we generally presume. The world does not turn on leaders and followers and on their relationship to each other. In fact, it often turns on followers' relationship to each other. So in this case, for example, if you're a diehard and you walk into the line of fire, you are not typically doing so because your leader or superior told you to do so, but rather because you want to save your brother or, or your sister. So in order to understand human relations, we need to look, among other places, at how followers relate to each other. In the book, I get into a somewhat extended, not very long, but a little bit long, uh, discussion of uh, what does it mean to be a good follower, bad versus good followership, and I came up with these five basic principles. Obviously, I elaborate on them, but this will, this will do for now. To do, to do nothing, principle number one, to do nothing, to be in no way involved is to be a bad follower. Principle number two, to support a leader who is good, as in effective and ethical, is to be a good follower. Number three, to support a leader who is bad, ineffective, and unethical, is to be a bad follower. Four, to support a leader who is good, effective, and ethical, is to be, 
excuse me, to oppose a leader who is good, effective, and ethical is to be a bad follower, and finally, to oppose a leader who is bad, ineffective, and unethical is to be a good, a good follower. And finally, um, again, my pitch, the overarching pitch of the book, my time is uh, just about run out, so I will conclude with these final three bullet points. The book is a plea for the end of leader centrism, again, not to give up the leader, but to also embrace at the same time the follower. Followers lack authority, but as I point out repeatedly, they do not, or they do not necessarily lack power and influence. This is important for each one of us to understand, and it is important for leaders and managers to understand. Second, followers who do something are usually, not always, but usually preferred to followers who do nothing. And finally, followers can be, and increasingly often they now are, agents of change. And I would simply end by saying that in growing numbers, followers are not necessarily taking on their leaders. Increasingly, they are simply circumventing them altogether. And some of the great sociopolitical movements of recent years are testimony to that, whether it's gay and lesbian rights or animal rights or any of those larger sociopolitical movements where leaders were not giving the people what they want, but uh, they did leave enough space for followers to take on the work themselves. And finally, this is not just an American phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. If you want to understand what happened in Pakistan during the last 12 months, don't look at Musharraf. Look at what happened to those who were beneath him, what they did, how they performed, how over a period of 10 or 12 months they pushed him out. I could point to countless other examples, many of the most vivid ones, for example, in China, where there are now seas of activists. So the days of looking at the leader only are or should be over, and I'm very much hoping, and I'm sure Ira is as well, he and I share this interest, that uh, you will all consider embracing the follower along with the leader. And Ira, I'm now turning the conversation back to you. Barbara, thank you so much. It's uh, really helpful to put the followership development in historic context, which you do so very well for us. And I particularly found it very helpful to see the clarity with which you define good followership and bad followership. We have a number of questions coming in. I'll take the first one here and read it to you. This is from Tara. I am a leadership educator, and I teach an introduction to leadership class that is comprised mostly of freshmen. Do you have any suggestions on how to teach followership to college students and end the never follow stereotype? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, especially uh, since, as you said earlier, Ira, I've been teaching followership here at the Kennedy School for a couple of years now, and I can tell you it's a bit of a hard sell. In other words, <laughs> By and large, students love going to leadership classes. In fact, leadership is now the most popular area of concentration at the Kennedy School because everybody thinks it's simply swell to be a leader. Uh, but I have also found that growing numbers of students are interested in followership. And I like to think that when they get the importance of it to their and make the connection to their own lives, they really get not only how this is from an intellectual point of view the necessary accompaniment to learning about leadership, but simply because in their own lives it teaches them that they too can have power and influence even if they're not in positions of authority. I think the degree to which we can connect our teaching to where the students are at this moment in their lives. And most of the students, especially if they're undergraduates, they're following. They follow their parents. They follow, uh, they follow community leaders. They follow the President of the United States, by and large, even if they disagree with him virulently. Uh, if they're starting to work in the worst place, they're going to be relatively low on the hierarchical ladder. 
So I think to the degree that we can connect the theory to the real-life experience of many of us, most of whom spend most of our lives being followers and not leaders, uh, that will facilitate it enormously. They're really, once you get <laughs> once you get a hold of them, they're really not resistant to the idea that followers do matter. I imagine that you're giving them a language about the different types of followership also help them very much to clarify the choices that they have. Yeah, I mean, I'm just reading in my first uh, set of student papers from this semester. Uh, by the way, students here at the Kennedy School are generally in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And this was a re this the one I'm thinking of, apropos your point, Ira, was uh, written by a relatively young woman who had been teaching in an inner city school. And she wrote her paper about dividing her class, how helpful it was to think of her classroom as being divided into these different types, isolates or students who kind of sit off in the back and who barely pay attention, versus activists, for example, who can be incredibly supportive of what the teacher is trying to do, or, as we all know, incredibly disruptive. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that's absolutely, it's a good point. I think if they can nail the types a little bit, they'll, it'll give them uh, a handle to hold on to as they're trying to get the larger concepts. Let me read the next question to you. This is, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, from Kuldip Rayat from the UK. The question is, do followers follow a leader or a vision? Whose vision is it? Is the leader just a manifestation or the vessel for the people's true vision, e.g. Barack Obama, and the followers of the vision for change? Wow, what a great question, a Barack Obama question. You know, for anybody who's interested in followership, this campaign is, like, amazing. Uh, and what's amazing is, in fact, the followers of Obama, and apropos him being a vestal. I think that's a great phrase. You know, uh, Hillary, as all of you know, most all of you know, ha accuses uh, Obama of being words and not action and so forth and so on. Well, whoever you support doesn't matter. She does have a point that he is, uh, tends to be quite vague in what he really plans to do. And it is this very vagueness. Many great, great speeches are, you know, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, what does that really mean? It's a kind of a vague but unbelievably great phrase to which lots of people ca can connect in ways that make sense to them in particular. And uh, so I think, you know, we never can, one of the reasons I've stayed in this field for so many years and find it so endlessly interesting is because questions such as the one that you just read, Ira, are not really neatly answerable. They're, sure, leaders are vessels into which we pour our own aspirations and dreams and fantasies, and there are also people in their own right who have their own ideas about what they're going to do. But when uh, you have a phenomenon such as we now have in this country, and, and we, it's not common, where one person seems to incite many people to get, I wouldn't say hysterical, that's too strong, but fervent in their admiration in huge numbers, uh, I think you do need to ask yourself exactly <laughs> what is happening here and why is it happening. But again, there's no single neat answer. What's fun is to play with the various ideas that uh, collectively, when you pull them all together, seem to offer some kind of coherent explanation. Sounds like there may be a future book there. <laughs> Here's a question. I'm not sure who it's from. It's from Orlando, Florida. How does this rec or maybe it's from Orlando, how does this recognition of followers differ from leadership replacement theory? Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not really sure how that term leadership replacement theories is used. You know, I try, you know, if, you, if any of you take a look at this book, you'll see that I write in very plain English. I write for people who are walking on the streets uh, in my town and who might want to wander into their Barnes and & Noble and, uh, or Borders bookstore and pick it up. I do not use any of the uh, leadership, I, I don't even want to say jargon, but of the sort of technical, I don't talk about idiosyncrasy credits and I don't talk about leadership replacement theories because I'm not sure that most people would have a clue as to what I was talking about. I try to keep it simple, 
stupid. You know, I, I, I'm not simplistic. I don't try to dumb it down. I think this is a smart book, not, of course, not a stupid one. But I use uh, ordinary language that is completely free of the kinds of things we write about when we're writing articles, the kind of language we use when we're writing articles for journals. So um, it's one of the tangles I think we get ourselves into if we – uh, if we try to be, I always think, uh, I'm cutting myself off here, but uh, let me just say one last word about this. In this language tangle, leader replacement, and who's a leader and who's a follower, I always think of James McGregor Burns, the wonderful James McGregor Burns. In his book, Leadership, that was, of course, one of the seminal tomes of the modern leadership uh, field, he makes a distinction between a leader and a power wielder. And he says, well, people like Hitler are not leaders, he says. He doesn't like, he, he has a value judgment and Hitler isn't a leader, Hitler's a, Hitler's a power wielder. And it's one point on which I've always disagreed with him, because if I go out into the street and I say, so you think Hitler was a power wielder, people say, wait a minute, wasn't he the leader of Nazi Germany between 1933 and 1945? So I myself, Stay very clear of all these kind of special words and special language. I want to speak to, if you, any of you teach in colleges, I want to speak to your undergraduates who've never taken a leadership course or read a leadership book. I want to speak to the American lay public who is interested in these issues so I don't get into the specifics of the different theories. Well, Barbara, I for one greatly appreciate that because if we're going to make a difference in our culture, speaking in a language that's easily accessible is a great virtue. Here's the next question. This is from Karen. I work largely in international contexts and find that there is a great resonance with your concept of the importance of the follower within the concepts of leadership from other cultural contexts. Do you also find this to be true? Well, I'm so grateful for the comment. Uh, I think my very last statement was very strongly supportive of what you're saying. Uh, you know, the Kennedy School is 40-plus percent non-American, and I currently have in my class students from all over the world, and I haven't had one say to me, I don't know what you're talking about. In fact, in some cultures, I guess one could broadly say Asian cultures in particular, the hierarchical nature of, you know, obedience and leaders and followers is uh, incredible grist for this mill. The, the, the point about leaders and followers and this pecking order that we always inclined to makes us part of the animal kingdom or queendom. Uh, anthropologists, for example, write vividly, or zoologists, about how animals of all, there's a, you know, chickens have a pecking order and so do we have a pecking order, and wolves and apes. So the proclivity that we have is not uniquely American and it's not even uniquely human. It is all animals in all places and all humans in all places. Now, of course, culture matters. And the way these dramas between leaders and followers play out is not the same in the United States as it is in Brazil or as it is, or as it is in Rwanda. But uh, once you embed the culture in the overarching context of this is the human condition, you will understand how these trends are not uniquely uh, those of the 21st century or of any particular place. Moreover, as I said, the idea of followers increasing in power and influence and leaders decreasing in power and influence is also something we see the world over, except in Putin's Russia, which is another conversation. Very good. There's a, a question here, Barbara, that uh, pretty uh, nuts and bolts, which is uh, from, from Joseph, where would I find the syllabus on a followership course? Uh, the syllabus uh, for my followership course, I'm teaching it in two parts this semester. One is called Followership and the other is called Followers. It runs together, they run the full semester and it's available online on the Kennedy School website. So it's freely available to anyone who wants to take a look at it. 
here's a question from Bonnie. She says, in our leadership work, we understand leadership to be located in the act of leading, not just in the person, within a hierarchy. We look at how leaders can rotate and support leadership within the group, which can mean being a good follower. Uh, in your work, it seems that leader and follower are more static within positions assigned only to those at the very top of an organization. Are we understanding this correctly? Well, yes and no. Um, you know, I think if we're uh, too fluid in our use of the word leader and follower, and, and thank you for the question, it's an important one because it gets raised a lot and we're talking about a time of flatter organizations and flattened hierarchies and leaders, everybody's a leader and nobody's a follower and leaders are fluid and followers are fluid and so forth. So a lot of this is now circulating in the last, again, roughly decade in particular and we all empower our followers so we change places. Uh, all of that is true, and I completely support it, and I talk about it in the book. But if you're going to come to grips with some concepts, and you're going to write about them, uh, you can't be too fluid, or they run away from you. You can't, you know, if I, say, if I started my book by saying what we just said, and I agree with the point, not, I don't disagree with it, but in order to come to grips with a subject, you have got to nail it down. Now, I said at the start, when I defined followers in a way that made sense for the writing of this book, I said my definition of followers and followership is uh, totally open to question. It's not engraved in stone. Somebody else can come up with another definition. That's fine by me. But it does provide a starting point. People don't normally define these terms at all, and that's why we keep chasing chasing the concepts and the ideas. So these are just uh, definitions that I saw fit to use for the purpose of writing this book. There are no other books out there quite like this one, uh, but I certainly agree with the questioner's point. These are fluid concepts, and again, particularly in the 21st century. We have a question from Christopher. If the leader-follower tie is weaker than most presume, then how does a leader raise followers from one type to another? Uh, you know, it's up to the leader, uh, arguably, to do that work, unless he or she is lucky enough to have some followers in tow who are willing to do that work uh, for him or her. I guess what I'm saying is that precisely because so many leaders are so inadequate. I'm not even saying they're bad. I'm saying they're inadequate, and one of the ways they're inadequate is that they're often not paying much attention to their followers. I mean, uh, again, you can use the humble example, if you will. Well, it's not such a humble example of the teacher in a classroom or the CEO of a very large organization. Uh, it's the squeaky wheel that gets most of the attention, the, 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 uh, the activists and the participants, the, pe the followers who make themselves heard and make their views known, and uh, others get much less attention. But one of the reasons for writing this book is I think simply, you know, this is a 60s phrase, consciousness raising. To the degree that we start to think about, if we're in positions of leadership and management, start to think about the differences among our followers and how to engage all of them in positive ways, I think it's going to help us be better leaders and better managers. Barbara, the next question is from uh, Gary. I think you've touched on this point, but you might want to expand on it. He asks, how do new social web technologies democratize leadership and change the dynamic between leaders and followers? And he gives the example, Obama followers are organizing themselves through blogging well beyond anything that he or his campaign is orchestrating directly. Yeah, I, I mean, that's just such a perfect case in point. I mean, it leads me back to the cop-out that I said earlier, which is I think we're only beginning to understand the ways in which technology are impacting on the relations between leaders and followers, and as the questioner implies, sometimes, uh, and I think it's a term I used earlier, sometimes making leaders nearly irrelevant. Uh, followers self-organize now. They do so by connecting to followers. They do so... Uh, through technology in ways that leave leaders out of the loop altogether. So um, I, I love the question because it's a 21st century question, and you can be sure 
that if we have this conversation 10 years down the line, the questions would be, again, technology-based in ways that we can't even now imagine. But I think the technology, the leveling influence of the technology, the capacity, let's say, for example, of shareholder activists to connect with each other and leave the board and leave the CEO and management out of the conversation, that's really powerful. And I don't claim to understand it yet. I think we're at the beginning of this. And it, I think we'll have seriously, uh, seriously, really important uh, implications for how we all interact, whether the label is leader and follower or follower and follower or whatever. This is a big deal, the technology that uh, the questioner uh, addresses. That technology that he's talking about, that example that was just raised about the nature of the Obama campaign and how, by the way, money was raised. I mean, it's stunning how the money was raised, small contributions through the Internet. This campaign is a consequence of the technology. I don't dismiss the role of Obama, but Obama could not have done it with his small amount of experience, his name that was not well known until very recently, could not have done it without the technology now available to us. I think this will be the last question we'll have time for, and then I'm going to make an announcement that I think will be of great interest to those with a deep interest in the subject of followership. This question is from Young P. Lu, and he says that servant leadership embodies the notion of leading by following from power over to power with. How does an individual, either leader or follower, come to understand and embody this paradigm? Well, I admit I love the question because some of us have been involved with uh, the ideas of servant leadership for many, many years. Uh, you know, um, if you look at some of the great leaders, they claim to be. They claim to be servants of the people. They claim to be watching what their followers uh, want and need and wish for and long for and, own, and doing no more, no more or less than carrying out those needs, wants, and wishes. Um, I do not talk about servant leadership in the book, again, precisely because I don't want to get too tangled in who is doing what for whom. You know, we, it gets so hard to sort out some of this stuff. You know, is the servant leader really a follower because the leader is following his followers? <laughs> um, these are really important concepts, and I think anyone who reads this book will take, will look at the concepts in it through their own uh, prism. So if you're interested in servant leadership, uh, it's not something I served you on a platter, uh, but I think if you look at the, the book and think about the, more importantly, think about the notion of the follower. Some, uh, as, as being part of this servant leadership and how that, how that loop really tangles or untangles itself, I think you'll find perhaps some new ways of looking at uh, some uh, familiar concepts such as servant leadership. Well, Barbara, thank you. And I, I think your, your remarks are suggesting how broad this field is and how hungry it is for, for further scholarship on all aspects of the complex dynamics of leader-follower relationships. Uh, thank you so much for sharing what you've learned through your research on followership. I want to encourage those of you listening who would like to explore the subject further to get hold of Barbara's book. It's very accessible. It's got important ideas on it, and it's very real. Uh, I promised you an announcement as well. For those of you who share a deeper interest in the topic of followership, I'd like to invite you to visit ILA's new learning community on followership. This community was born out of the first national conference on followership that was held two years ago at Claremont University. Two ILA board members, Ron Riggio and Jean Lipman Blumen, joined me in hosting the conference, at which Barbara also spoke. And at that point, it was clear that we needed a space where those who are interested in the many aspects of followership can meet to share ideas and resources. I'm delighted to let you know that ILA has agreed to host this community. It will officially launch next week, 
If you're interested, please go to the communities page of ILA's website, which again is ila-net.org. There you'll find links to the new followership wiki and the followership forum. Please explore them, and if so moved, join in the conversation. Finally, let me again thank Barbara Kellerman and all. Thank you so much, Ira, and thank you, everyone, for participating in this event. I'm really grateful to you all. Yes, and I trust we'll all go out into the world a little better equipped to contribute to it through both good leadership and good followership. Thank you all.